No, 100%. So, like, in the past, we had some investors who were looking to buy a building. And, of course, they, they invite me along the site, the one of their first site visits to understand, like, how the building is shaped and how we can kind of maximize the use, right? And before I had the machines and the equipment, you know, I would just take notes or take pictures. But then what happened was some investors didn't buy it for months, and then we forget what's going on or we, we have to catch up. And it's added double the work than originally thought of. So in order to make sure we're getting all the information at the start, even though they may forget about it later on, we record everything from our glasses, it's like everything, like the audio is there too, audio and visual, right? And the machine that we have now scans the entire building to make sure we don't miss anything. It captures all the plumbing, any of the electrical stuff, the studs, the walls, the ceilings, the layouts. We could do preliminary floor plans just off that scan in the same day. Right. So imagine getting your floor plans again, preliminary, right? Because they're all millions of dots put together. Welcome to the Deals Estate Wholesaling Podcast, where we discuss finding, financing, and facilitating off-market real estate deals. I'm your host, Deji Adunton, and I'm joined on the show by Henry Rojas to discuss and share his experience implementing permits and designs for over 500 investment units across Ontario. A little bit about Henry. He has over seven years of experience in the architectural field and also real estate investments. He started working on custom homes and extensive home additions way back in 2017. He recently shifted his focus completely to real estate investment projects by always looking out for his fellow investor to ensure that he gets them the highest and best use on their projects. Today, Henry has completed over 500 units across Ontario, anywhere from duplexes to ADUs, low-rise and high-rise apartment buildings. In today's episode, Henry and I discuss which markets he's seeing the most conversion upside today. We also discuss what are some of the ways investors can find and spot these types of properties with conversion upside. And finally, we discuss the common mistakes and pitfalls that investors make when looking to do these conversion projects. Guys, you do not want to miss this episode. Now, before we dive in, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who is listening. Please rate and like and subscribe. Turn on your notification buttons. We would appreciate a five-star rating. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Hi, Henry. Welcome to the Deals Estate Wholesaling Podcast. Hey guys, so appreciate you appreciate you uh, inviting me here. I'm very excited to discuss with you everything I know about multifamily conversions, permits, and everything how we can help you guys as a real estate investors kind of increase your ROI in this world. Whoa, I love it, man! And I, you know, thank you very much. First off, thank you very much for coming on. I think, um, like, I'm excited to have you here. Not because I'm saying that, but because I know that <laughs> you're going to drop a lot of bombs. Um, I follow you on social media. Love your content. You know, love your your signs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but beyond like all those interesting uh, visualizations, I think the content is is just sick, man. So um, I, I'm more excited about the value that you're going to share to everyone who's listening. So thank you very much, man. Not a problem. That's all we're, we're trying to do here, right? So, you know, I'm telling people like, you know, if you have any questions, there's no such thing as a stupid question, at least for me, any time to do with permits, real estate, even my point of view things there, love to share. And that's why, and we'll dive a little bit more into it too. Like I go to real estate network events just to share information, yeah. right? That's yeah, where yeah. the key value is. And honestly, man, like the, the part of real estate that you are in, it almost feels like a black box, like designs, permits, you know, a lot of people are looking at properties. They don't know if this property can be maybe a, like it's a single family. They don't know if it can be a duplex. They don't know if it can be a triplex. And from a wholesaling standpoint, from an off-market standpoint, when you are speaking with sellers, I imagine there will be questions that you can ask that give you an indication. You know, so there's a lot of things that I feel like a lot of people might want to learn, you know, from the conversation today. So I'm just excited to, you know, to dive into it. 
A hundred percent. There's always going to be questions, and we're more than happy to share what we know, especially when every city is a little bit different. So yeah, that's yep. where we, we <clears throat> that's where we come in. Cool, man. So you know, let's jump into. It. We usually start off the episode by asking for an intro or a background. So, you know, can you tell us more about yourself? I know we mentioned that in the intro, but can you tell us more about yourself, your background, how you got into real estate, you know, how you got into designs and promising? Yeah, so so a little bit about myself. A lot of my family members do a lot of construction. Um, a lot of them are really like hands-on type of thing, right? Um, and all my life, I've just been growing up with that kind of like mindset, like, you know, maybe I'll be at, like in the construction area myself, Yeah. yeah. but, uh, I found out pretty quick. So it was not too handsy. I am just terrible <laughs> with my hands. I cannot do it right now to save my life. You put me to do like a flip. I am not going to be able to do it. Not for, <laughs> I can't. So I, I quickly realized that in my early teens and then I'm like, you know what? I still want to be involved in construction. What else can I do here? Uh, you know. And that's where I found architecture and the drawings and the city mm. and the stuff that the contractors aren't too familiar and don't even want to do anyways. Yeah. I'm like, sure, <laughs> I might as well do that for them, right? I'll still be connected to the, the contractors and the construction team in my family. So might as well start doing something like that. So that's where I went. Took three years of, uh, you know, uh, technology program in Sheridan College in the Brantham area. Nice. And, you know, uh, as, you know, a week after I graduated, I started like working for a custom home builder or designer in the Oakville area back in 2017. And since then, from 2017 to I say 2020, I was going back and forth in different jobs from custom homes. We did a couple of Tim Hortons projects, the newer stuff you mm. see nowadays. We nice. did apartment buildings. I, I work for an, uh, a global apartment building office, but so they have apartment buildings in Europe, the U.S., Canada, and they have a massive amount of units there so kind of understand how they kind of figure out their stuff because for them to employ that many people and that many buildings they have to be doing something right so yep, it was a yep. good learning experience there but then obviously during 2020 we had a whole COVID situation yep. and you know i took this as an opportunity to kind of like you know what i enjoy real estate a little bit you know what else can i do here and that's where even taco was like mentioning you know why don't you come work on the other side you suck at construction, but you know how to manage, you know how to organize, <laughs> right? I need somebody like you with that sort of skill set. So I'm like, you know what? Sure. I've done it for so long for on the drawings. I might as well kind of see how the other side works. So, yeah. yeah so I did uh, I basically intern under him for about a year, give or take, doing construction management, seeing how that side works, seeing how the drawings are really just pretty pictures for the contractors to use. But, you know, a lot of things on site is so different and you have to have a good understanding of why they do what they do there. Right. So mm. it's a good mm. year of just like trying to understand that mindset. Um, and then we're flash forward until like 2021. Uh, you know, I wanted to get out of the construction a little bit just because again, I'm not, I, I do not enjoy it whatsoever. So <laughs> I moved on to different companies and then back, what was it? 2023 or 2022. I started to do a lot of my own stuff. Right. Mm. So I started my own company, started my own stuff, did my own, pro started my own stuff, did my own projects, started working with real estate investors because this whole time since 2017, I've been doing little things here and there. Yeah. I was really started diving into it was talk in 2020. Right. Mm. So mm. understand that side of construction and my own stuff and trying to see how we can help investors understand that part of the business. Because since then, a lot of investors understand a lot about the, the deals and what to do before. But once they have the deal, who really helps them with the construction, the design, the permits, anything to do with the paperwork with the city? Like how, who helps them in that case? So that's yeah. where I kind of come in and kind of explain to them how that system or process works. And now we're flash forward hmm. today where now we've done over 500 investment projects from anything from duplexes to apartment buildings, right? And trying to maximize the value of the property, right? So that's how we're kind of tied into the real estate. Woo, bro, like that was hot, man. You know, th thank you very much for that. I don't know if, if, if I can even call it a summary, but that was a very, very extensive and detailed summary. I, I always had a question, you know, when you said you were doing the drawings and then you moved to the other side, construction management. So um, there's a difference between you doing the drawings and you managing the construction projects. Like, how do you see those two roles, you know, being very different? Yeah, so the construction stuff, there's so many things to do in, in that case, you know. In terms of the drawings, it's just, it's simple. It's myself. It's just doing the design. I understand the building code. That's, you know, pretty simple. But when you're doing construction management, there's so many different little factors you have to account for, right? Where the materials are coming from, the delivery dates, how the kitchen's assembled, any touch-ups you need to do. Is the contractors that you hire are going to actually be there? Is a framing guy going to be there? If not, is there any conflicts with the electrician or the plumbers? Wow. There's so, so much more little management. management. 
A hundred percent, right? You have to make sure everything aligns properly. And if it doesn't, you got to think fast, like kind of quick. Like, what can you do to fix this up? Because this unit's being rented out on the 1st of May or something, right? Yeah, so you have like yeah, yeah. 48 hours to get this thing done, <laughs> right? So because they already rented out. They're, they start renting out units at 90%. And at 90%, you think 10% is not a lot. But if all the little <laughs> touch-ups and the contractors don't answer your phone and you have to get some little piece of equipment left into the units, it's going to, you know, it's you have to be able to be on top of that. Interesting, man. Okay, so... You you did that for a bit. You, you didn't like it, um, and and now you've you've moved on to like fully real estate investment, doing drawings. Um, you mentioned something that you know the code, so you are able to do the drawings. I wanted to take a step back, right, and um, just acknowledge the fact that not everybody knows the code. So you know, I wanted to talk a bit about building codes, zoning bylaws, and just to get you know your thoughts on why the, like the knowledge of these things this information this document this process why this information is very critical in today's market where a lot of buildings are not cash flowing and the only way some buildings can cash flow is only if you maybe do like um a conversion or like an infill or something so i just wanted to get your thoughts on your just how you perceive the importance and the value of getting more knowledge and more education around zoning bylaws around conversions around um you know these things into these markets no for sure and this is where some investors struggle in um and again i just tried to educate them and understand that process and the value of that so number one thing is checking the zoning right every single city is going to be different with zoning maybe they have some sort of similarities to like you know low density medium density high density but the number one thing when you're looking to buy a property, even from the, the agents and the, the wholesaler side, you need to understand what can you possibly do on this lot? What's permitted under this lot, under the, the current zoning bylaws? Maybe you're only allowed to do single family in this area, or maybe <laughs> you can do duplexes. But now with the whole Bill 23, we're kind of allowed to do like up to three units on all lots in Ontario. That being said, just because Isn't it's allowed- that subject to the municipality? Yes, that's what my, I was going to say. Yeah, because a lot of municipalities are still working on updating their bylaws. So when it first came out, some municipalities were like, you know what, you can do whatever you want. Just make sure you send us the paperwork and we should be able, it, it should be fine. Even though we're currently working on revising our bylaws, you can still make Got that it. application. I remember okay. Barry at that time was kind of very friendly to that approach. And some cities mm. were like, don't do anything because we're not proving it yet. Give us one yeah, year. Yeah. Which now Whoa. we're at the one year and a half mark now. So it's been about almost 18 months, I would say. And now yeah. a lot of cities have actually changed up their bylaws to now they're pushing for four units. Like in London, Mississauga, Toronto, Hamilton, they're allowing like four or five units. So now hmm. the value okay. of that building just increased tremendously from like two, three years ago where you were only allowed to do a duplex. But now if you find out you can do a triplex or fourplex, you know, now you can see, okay, it's much more valuable than hmm. I thought it was. Right? Maybe. Okay. Back then, it, well, you didn't want to sell it, but now you want to sell it because you have that much value. Okay, so there's a question that came to mind. You mentioned a couple of markets. Now that it's been about 18 months since Bill 23, if you had to mention five markets, right? And the reason why I'm asking is from a wholesaling standpoint, from an off-market standpoint, you know, there's a 12-step process that we usually tell investors who are looking to get into like the wholesaling space. You know, there's a 12-step process we take them through. The first step is choosing your market. And one of the criteria for choosing your market is, you know, the types of properties you find in this market, you know, is the market good for conversion upside, you know, or is the market bad for conversion upside? Because when you are looking to assign properties, it's valuable that you're assigning a property in a market where the conversion upside is very high. So, you know, from someone who's looking to find off market deals, if they are thinking of the top three or top five markets where they feel the city is very favorable, they don't waste time, you know, they don't joke around, like they're really fast. You could get your permits like very fast. Like what three to five markets would come to mind as very proactive, very progressive. And, you know, this is a market where you should, you can essentially pitch your tent long term. So right away, the first property, when you said that, the first thing I thought about was Welland, right? Mm. South of St. Catherine's area. It's like, and I have my own triplex there too, myself. Um, obviously this was like two, three years ago, but since then yep. I've been hearing so many good things about it. We've done a project there recently from, you know, we had two more units in the apartment building and it was fairly quick. It was like, yep. these guys are no joke. Like they want development in that city and they, they don't want any excuses to not approve a permit. So nice. it's like the turnaround there is so much quicker than some of the other cities we work with. 
Like and a, a fair comparison to that I would make is like St. Catharines, right? You'd assume St. Catharines would be just as good just because it's so <laughs> close by. But believe me, I that's the one market I will not touch ever again just because it's been so difficult with them to work with, like the planning and the building staff. It's like it's not the friendly. Well, I, I can't say it's not the friendliest, but it's the most difficult to get a permit from there mm-hmm. versus okay. Welland. That's 12 minutes away by, by car, right? Got um, it. Okay. Very so well, yeah. Well, well, it's a good area. Uh, Barry is a good area. We've done a couple of projects up there, which is the turnaround is, you know, the standard two three weeks. It hasn't been like a massive delay. Whoa! So that's, we've been that's great. Yeah. So they they follow the building code like timeline. So I wouldn't say like they're they're pushing it for like three four months, right? But uh, it's been fairly good up there. And I would say the last market again. I'm going to be biased on this area, but it's more of like Hamilton area, just because <laughs> I need you know, to mention Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I know because I we we do a lot of business in Hamilton, and regardless of what some people may say about Hamilton, right, and how slow the building permit can be in that area, I still see so much value more waiting an extra month or two versus like buying in another location. Hmm. But that's helpful, you know. Like I think this is really big, like for people to really zone in on the areas where there's a lot more activity that's happening. So, you know, can you maybe walk us through like at a very high level, like the challenges and the strategies that are involved in sort of navigating these laws? Because the truth is, every every city's laws are different. You know, the, the zoning is different. Um, you know, what are the top challenges that you see that investors face in just navigating zoning bylaws and just interpreting what these municipalities want uh, with respect to conversion? Yeah. So the, the most common sort of problem there I would see is more of like uh, the investors will look, look into zoning themselves. And again, just for everyone to get, get familiarized with the zoning, anybody can look into zoning, yourself, yeah. myself, my brother who has nothing to do with like architecture <laughs> or whatever, like, you just need to search up, like, what was it? Let's say, for example, City of Hamilton Zoning Interactive Map. That's all you have to type into Google. Or Is Toronto. the map working now? Like, like, yeah. like I tried it a few days ago. I, I think the hack, you know, affected it, but is it working now? Uh, no, no. It's, it's been like a month now. It's I have to go there. In per- I was there in person today, so I, that's the only way I can get zoning information. But, okay, Hamilton was a bad example. But if you go to Toronto or Mississauga or Welland, they have the interactive map still up and running. To my okay. knowledge, okay. so they're okay. still they're still okay. They're still okay, okay. right? But um, so you do that, and then you can find the zone in code there, like RM R two, whatever it is, and you can fairly find that information easily. The problem is there are some cities that have like you know, uh, what do you call it? The fine print, I would call it. So you hmm. have to be able to read the entire zoning bylaws, find the yeah. fine print, because that little fine print could screw over your entire like deal. And yeah. I, yeah. I don't like to be dramatic about that, but like one example we had about a few months ago was we were looking at a deal in Hamilton for an apartment building okay. and we're like, Oh, we can convert the ground floor in this downtown area into like residential units. Great. The numbers make sense. But then the zoning bylaws like, by the way, Henry, you have to make sure your ground floor level is like three feet higher than the, the sidewalk. But yeah. <laughs> by doing so now we, we don't have enough ceiling height. So now we can't even do the project. We can't even do those three units in the, on the ground floor. So that screw up our entire process there. And we have to move on to the next building. To, to buy right yeah but that, those are little things so if, if the investor had bought it because he's allowed to do 10 units or whatever and they didn't look at that fine print then he's stuck with that building and he can't yeah. do those units right so i say that's the biggest kind of like value you have to look into the fine print of everything and even knowing the right questions like I, I brought some investors with me to the city and i let them kind of speak to the city just to let them understand how that works but then when i ask the questions that i need to know of they're like, oh, I wouldn't have thought about that because I didn't think that was important. But yeah, I think yeah. everything is important just because one little thing could trigger everything, right? Like yeah. a domino effect. So what you're saying is, is, is ringing a bell in my head. Um, and I don't know if the zoning bylaw affects this or, you know, like is responsible for this. But there was, I would say, a land development project that someone brought to me and I was analyzing it. And I think it, from a part of the bylaw, it was in Hamilton, from a part of the bylaw, the zone like the zoning allowed for a certain height and, you know, certain number of stories and a number of units. But there was somewhere in the document that specified, okay, the parking requirements on the ground floor. There was also like, I think someone mentioned that you also require an elevator if the number of stories reach a certain level. So, you know, I'm not sure if you get that type of information in the zoning documents where based off the height, based off the number of stories, you know, you have to get like an elevator, for example, you know, in the building. 
So that's more of a building code um, requirement there. It's not more of zoning. Zoning doesn't really care about elevators. The, okay. the building code will tell you, you know, if you go over three stories and you're a certain size, you have to be able to provide an elevator, right? Okay. Um, that's the, and again, this is where people get confused about zoning versus building. But yeah, elevator to me wouldn't fall under zoning. It's just more of a building code requirement, which we rarely do because we try to stick to like buildings and like, you know, um, situations where we don't have to have an elevator unless yep. the elevator is already there because adding an elevator is like another hundred thousand to that building, you know, yep. especially yep. when you're including maintenance. It's just, I wouldn't do it if you don't, if you're not adding a tremendous amount of units, right? It's not okay. worth it. So to your point, I, are you able to go through the permitting and design process without necessarily having to check the building code or do you always have to check the building code for every project that you do? No. So at this point, I'm fairly familiar with the building code. I don't need to check anything unless, and the only time I really check the building code is really when I'm having a, a discussion with a city. So yeah. how I interpret something and how they interpret something could be completely different. Got it. I had this argument with so I, I can't say argument, but more of the discussion with the city multiple times because Again, I'm explaining it from my point of view, and it seems yep. to work. But then if, I, if I have to, ex if I have to explain it to like ten different people from ten different cities, again, sometimes we don't work with the same examiner. That's another thing. You can okay. have a property right beside me, and we got two completely different examiners. So okay. I have to explain this, the, my my interpretation twice. Right? Okay, and okay. that's the only really time I have to use that building code kind of reference there. Okay, so I'm looking at the journey of you know someone that's doing wholesaling or someone who's buying off markets. And, you know, chances are that the, the stage in the journey that they would come to you would most likely be when they've bought the property already. And, you know, they're looking to maybe do that due diligence. Um, for someone who is just analyzing an off-market deal, for example, you're speaking with the seller. Um, are there certain questions that they can ask that I would say indicates the possibility that this building qualifies for one of those projects? Are there certain things that they can do? I know you mentioned that, you know, you have one massive device that when you do a walkthrough, it just <laughs> gives you every single thing. You know, can you maybe talk to us about, you know, what a wholesaler or an investor who is buying off market needs to look out for when they are speaking with sellers, when they are doing walkthroughs, and also just tell us what that big machine you have <laughs> does for you guys. 100%. So. And, uh, you know, I, I'll treat the same way I'm treating with other, like, uh, agents and realtors as well. It's no different yep. from them. The principle is still there. Really, we walk through these buildings with the investors, and if they don't – again, if we can't manage our time there. We can't meet their own schedule. But things I, I tell them to look out for is, number one, ceiling height, right? Okay. A lot of times they're trying to do basement apartments or some sort of conversion in the building, but a ceiling height doesn't account for that. I tell them to look out for it because the duplex that everyone's familiar with and everyone loves – it's completely different from like the triplex and up. There's two, okay. like, that's the biggest red flag, the well, biggest flag you should look out for. Yeah. So a lot of times I tell the agents and wholesalers, like, if you're looking to do a duplex, here's a checklist of things you hmm. need to look at versus the checklist of things you need to look at versus a triplex. There are two okay. completely different checklists. So uh, can you walk us through, like, at a very high level, it doesn't have to be everything, but mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. like a duplex, what are the top three things to check where it's, like, this mm -hmm. can be a deal breaker if these things are not there versus yeah. a triplex. <laughs> yeah, so the top three things for duplex. Let's let's talk about ceiling heights. Minimum okay. six five, and just be you know be aware it's it's minimum six five to the finish floor to the finish ceiling. A lot of the investors are making the mistake of measuring from the the concrete slab on the basement to the joist, the open ceiling. Which now, when you do the math, you're off by two inches, and those two inches, depending on your inspector, might tell you to like you know do some additional work there. So keep in mind it's finish to finish. The next thing is like the fire step, the fire exits. Right for a duplex, you're going to need at least one dedicated exit or a shared exit way, plus the, obviously the egress window that everyone's familiar with. Yeah. Right. The biggest thing is a lot. Of, um, a lot of times we always have to increase the window size. The windows in, the, in a traditional basement is never big enough. We mm -hmm. always have to increase that size and at least make it big enough for an egress, basically a person to kind of fit through and exit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right. And the okay. last thing to do is like uh, the fire separation. That's the, like the biggest thing to understand. A lot of times the investors are looking at the uh, the floor assembly or they buy, a they buy a house with a finished basement, but that finished basement wasn't permitted or wasn't by permits back then. And sometimes we can get away with keeping the, the finished ceiling as is, and that's great. We don't have to spend more money. Other times, the city would want us to kind of 
it's a 50 50 chance where they want to demolish the finished ceiling and get it get it to be a proper fire separation and sound separation between the two units oh, right. okay that's the biggest issue because it's the difference between zero dollars doing nothing and like another like ten thousand to do a ceiling Got right? it. so that definitely affects your numbers in that case so those are the top three things to look out for the duplexes in terms of like three the, things they cut across all markets like the six yeah. five you mentioned across all markets yeah okay i would say it's, it's across all markets there are some cities like the city of hamilton which they have allowed like six six feet one inch under the bulkheads so you'll see in the basement you have like drop you know the duct work or the mm -hmm. beam work underneath those areas you can have six one mm -hmm. right because yeah. hamilton at least under like is following the national building code i don't know why the other cities aren't following it but hamilton is definitely for sure following that six one requirement from the national building code got it okay right so then uh when we're talking about the triplex conversion because you'll see a, a duplex and we've done it before sorry a uh, bungalow You'll see a bungalow and you might be able to do three units inside a bungalow, right? Two on the main floor, one in the basement. It sounds great. So here are the top three things I would kind of keep in mind when you're going to explore that option. Number one is a fire separation. Like in terms of like the, now with the fire separation, it's a hundred percent. You're going to need to make sure every single wall, every single ceiling is fire rate. There's no 50, 50 anymore. Like a duplex. Yeah, yeah. you're going to need to do it. Right. And it's because it's more it's a more hazard area versus like a duplex. Instead of like four or five people in a duplex, you're dealing with like maybe ten people in a triplex. Yeah. Like for example, depending on bedrooms. But again, that's how it usually works there. The second thing is the engineering stuff. So this is where the, the investors get kind of scared because for a duplex, we're looking at around the five, six thousand mark for soft cost. But for a triplex, now we're jumping up to like twelve thousand, fourteen thousand. Because a city understands like a triplex is a building by definition. They want the plumbing drawings, the HVAC drawings. They want fire alarm safety plans. Even though it's only like three units, you need to have to yeah, provide yeah. a fire safety plan. Interesting. So that increases the cost. Of the, again, we don't want to charge that. But if the city is demanding that, we're going to need to provide it. Right? Got it. We got stopped before not providing it. Um, hmm. So, yeah, increase engineering fees. Obviously, the fire separation and even the fire exit routes. Right? So here's a big issue that's happening with triplexes so let's say for example you're in the backyard you have a backside unit you exit the backside unit and you're running around the building to get to the front yard to escape the fire that whole wall that you're running across should be fire separated technically so the windows would have to be fire rated any of the doors would have to be fire rated and now you're adding like tens of thousands of dollars to that one wall in case you know there's a fire in the house yeah so yeah there are more costs until like doing a triplex much more than like a duplex because obviously it's a building or a small building by definition. Okay. Well, thanks for, for breaking that down. So, you know, from an ROI standpoint, you know, given the fact that, you know, with the duplex, you don't have as, as many costs with the triplex, there's a significant jump in costs with the fourplex. I, I imagine, you know, the cost would be almost the same with the triplex from an ROI standpoint, do you feel it's most practical and, um, you know, most reasonable to go with three units or four units or two and that's units. A well, okay. So I, and again, I'm not the numbers guy too often, but uh, from my understanding, the duplex numbers don't work nowadays. The, the triplex numbers seems to be working fairly well, especially since there's not really development charges to be too concerned about with most mm -hmm. cities, right? They're kind of, they're waived. Like before you had to pay like 12,000, 15,000 per unit. Now it's like zero. So you're saving money on that part. The fourplex conversion, it gets difficult because a lot of our investors are buying these these houses in uh you know in the in the market where it has that attic space. Mm -hmm. And the attic will be the fourth unit, technically. And in order for that to be legalized, you need to provide its own separate exit, which requires like a, a brand new wood deck or metal uh escape on the back side, and that's going to cost you another twenty thousand. Got right. it. Okay. So the no again to me, if I was going to do it myself, I was, I'd be I stick to a triplex. Keep it simple there. Make them all two bedrooms or whichever bedrooms that are are good for the neighborhood in that market space. And fourplexes, it's it depends. If if it was a really big house, like a big bungalow, and we can do four units on the like two in the ground, two in the basement, sure, let's do that. My rule of thumb is, and what I tell like the wholesalers and uh, agents. Because they go by square foot too. You guys go by like how big the, the, the house is by square feet. I tell them, if you have a thousand square feet, we can make two one bedrooms, 500 square feet each. That's good enough. We can even make a bachelor at like 275 square feet. Hmm. Right. So there are okay. options there. And I've done this before where they'll tell me the square footage and I'll tell them how many units we could add in theory. 
without looking at the building. Okay. So, um, you know, thanks for that. When you guys are doing these walkthroughs, you know, um, how do you get to a point where you look at the building and say, okay, this building can be a triplex, can be a fourplex. You know, um, I know right now when you guys do walkthroughs, that like you go with the reband glasses, you go with, with, you know, with the device you mentioned. You know, can you walk us through how those two devices help you in, you know, optimizing your time, you know, during the walkthroughs and getting to a point where you can basically advise your investors on what the highest and best uses? No, 100%. So, like, in the past, we had some investors who were looking to buy a building. And, of course, they, they invite me along the site, the one or so, first site visits to understand, like, how the building is shaped and how we can yeah. kind of maximize the use, right? And before I had the machines and the equipment, you know, I would just take notes or take pictures. But then what happened was some investors didn't buy it for months, and then we forget what's going on or we, we have to catch up. And yeah. it's yeah. double the work than originally thought of. So in order to make sure we're getting all the information at the start, even though they may forget about it later on, we record everything from our glasses, like everything, like the audio is there too, audio and visual, right? And the machine that we have now scans the entire building to make sure we don't miss anything. It captures all the plumbing, any of the electrical stuff, the studs, the walls, the ceilings, the layouts. We could do preliminary floor plans just off that scan in the same day. Right. So imagine getting your floor plans again, preliminary, right? Because they're all millions of dots put together, like right in front of you, so we can kind of lay it out quickly. And I've done that before where I'm scanning in the morning, we go in the afternoon, I process the file, and then in the afternoon before, you know, evening, we we go on a Zoom call and I show them, listen, this is the layout that we got today. This is what I'm thinking to make how many units based on this the square footage here. Right. Wow. So that's how we kind of get back. So they know right away. They know the same day they get they get me out there. They'll get the same information, you know, they'll get an answer for, for them to talk to their mortgage broker or their lenders, you know, mm. this is how much we need to get to make sure this number makes sense, right? Okay. Now, number of units there matters so much because they want to squeeze in as much as they can to make sure they maximize everything. Perfect. So I have a question then. So, you know, from an off-market standpoint or from a wholesaling standpoint, if, for example, a seller lead comes in, and I'm speaking with the seller, and the seller tells me, okay, I have... Maybe an, like an 11 unit building, or I have a five unit building, or I have a single family, you know, I think there's an upside there. And I want to do a walkthrough. And I'm thinking, you know what, I probably don't have, you know, the Reban glasses, like the Meta glasses. I don't have, you know, Henry's tool. But can I maybe get Henry to join me on this walkthrough? Mm -hmm. You know, so do you do that kind of service? Do you offer that, that type of service to investors where you join them on the walkthrough? when they haven't really purchased the building, like is that a paid service you do or is that something that you you do, you know, to help investors to even get a better sense of what they can offer for the building? A hundred percent. And we understand from our different level of investors, some of them, of course, have a bigger budget than others. But for now, until otherwise noticed, like we're providing that sort of free <laughs> service, right? Depending, again, depending on the demand, if everyone's asking for this, hey, we'll, we'll, put, a, we'll put a price tag to it. But for now... Was our, you know, was our loyal, like, uh, real estate investors that have been working with us for last year and some new investors are coming with us before, I would say, the multifamily conference this year. We're yeah. going to provide that service for free, right? Okay. The... Okay. So, yeah. and I'm asking because, as you know, you know, like, we have a community of, of, of investors. They are primarily wholesalers, flippers, and active investors. And the, the community, as you know, Wholesale Wednesday is, 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 was built to essentially help them acquire off-market properties directly from sellers. So it's not like we're giving them an off-market property or they're buying from a realtor. This is to help them buy directly. So hmm. would it be possible, for example, where, you know, in that group, anyone from that group, for example, if they have an off-market deal that they're working on, you know, would you be able to join them, for example, like for the walkthrough, you know, to help them you know, get that deal under contract? No, 100%. If any one of your, you know, your team members there is looking to like get, pick my brain a little bit and wants to invite me to for a walkthrough, I'm more than happy to do so. Just give me a couple of days heads up, you know? <laughs> that's all That's all I need, right? It, it, this is me putting you on the spot. 
<laughs> Sorry about that, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's great because for me, I, I love sharing the knowledge. I love explaining to people the process, right? Because again, and this is just some investors that misunderstand how our roles are into this community, right? We're not just designers. We don't just draw pretty pictures. That's the easy part. The hard part is dealing with the city and making sure everything's on point, right? So we want to be able to help out the investors from uh, that, you know, the starting point all the way up to the end point, right? So if that helps you and your community. I'm more than happy to do so, right? And again, it's for free right now, but again, <laughs> depend on the pen, the demand, right? Because again, I can explore. I've done it before where I went to four different site visits in one day and got all the information for like four different investors. So cool. we, we've been able to do it like that, right? Group them up together. Luckily, they're all in the Hamilton area, but still, like yeah. depending on where it is, right? But yeah, that's, the, that's how valuable it is, right? I can go to four different site visits, right? For your students or for your, you know, your team members, I can go there. And show them all. Or in our case, like we're trying to do some prop, more, some more property tours. It's yep, hard to yep. explain to you what I visualize unless we actually go see a property ourselves and show everyone at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot, man. And sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. No, no, it's perfect. It's I love it. I love it. All right. Cool. So we spoke a lot about like single families to like duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, which a lot of people consider small multis. You know, a lot of people consider it as residential multifamilies. Um, but there's also five units and above that, you know, would be tagged commercial properties. From your standpoint, a lot of conversions happen in the zero to four. Conversions also, also happen in the five and above. Uh, do you see any difference between those types of assets? Do you have a preference? You know, is, is one easier? Is one more expensive? Is Does one have a higher ROI? Just want to get your, your, your thoughts yeah. on residential versus commercial there. No, 100%. And the first thing I'm going to say is the more the merrier. Do not, <laughs> like, like, and, and, and here, like, before I get too much into it, like, I have my own triplex. I spend okay. like nine or 10 months on it. And okay. the amount of effort, sweat, tears I had is just like it wasn't worth it for three units versus mm. like, let's say the eight unit that we're working on in Hamilton. Yeah, it's the same amount of sweat and days that we're working on it. But at the end of the day, we're going to get eight units versus the three units that I originally had, right? The pros and, and here's here's the pros. Does the number of like, units do the number of units increase your work, or it's just more like I'm doing the designs for, mm -hmm. like I'm doing the designs one off, right? Even if it's two units or ten units, the work isn't necessarily increased because of the number of units. So depending on how many units we're actually converting, like brand new units, it does increase the amount of work we have to put into it. But okay. like, let's say it's like a like, I don't know, like a 10 unit apartment building versus a 20 unit apartment building. And we're only adding one unit to each of them. That amount of work isn't really going to change that much, right? Okay. Most of these purpose built purpose buildings have been designed in the way that their layouts is the same thing, right? So for like, let's say a purpose built 20 plex, 20 unit apartment building, five stories up, four units on each floor. I'm going to safely assume that uh, the second all the way up is the same thing because it was purpose built. Mm -hmm. Why is that going to make me charge you guys more? and put more effort into it when they're all the same layouts. The only Got time it. it changes is if, like, let's say the, the tenant, for some reason, did some renovations that the property manager at that time didn't pick up on, right? I but see. That's very, that's very rare. It's never really happened too often, but yeah. So there's not too <laughs> much work into that, right? Um, but like, back to the whole four, yeah, up to four units and then five plus. We are ten, like mo moving towards more of the five plus units just because of the, you know, CHC financing, MY select program, the financial stuff on that side is a lot more easier. And, you know, even with the city stuff is a lot easier just because the city understands these buildings were purpose built. They were meant to be like multifamily from the get go. And mm. so already has all the systems in place to kind of accommodate for that versus the single family home or duplexes that were never meant to be more than one or two units. They were never designed to be like three or four units. So now you're taking like a house and converting to a building. There's going to be a lot more work to, that needs to be done for that household, which is a confusion with some investors that are like, they're like, well, you know, two to three is not such a big deal, but it is to the city at least. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that effort from two to three versus like 10 to 11, I do 10 to 11 all day long, just because the city already understands <laughs> it's not that much difficulties to work with. Obviously construction is yeah. a little bit tough there. Right. But in terms of like the permit work and such, it's not as difficult as two to three, which is it's tough to explain to some investors why the cost is like, you know, not that much different, which again, you know, it's more work for two to three versus like 10 to 11 because of how you're changing house to building 
and build into okay. building. You know, Got as, it. Oh, as simple as I can make it there. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah, man. Like, mm-hmm. thanks for simplifying this because, <laughs> you know, if someone had heard this house, I'd be like, oh, man, what's going on here? Okay. So, <laughs> and that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, from your standpoint, if you were to call out the most interesting or the most unique project that you've worked on, either in the past, maybe it's current, or maybe it's a future one that you're about to do, like, what would be that mm-hmm. unique or interesting project that you would call out? Mm-hmm. So right away, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the futures because, because there's some interesting projects that we're working on, but the investors are still finalizing that, <laughs> um, which I can't say too much right now, but I'll definitely post on my Instagram later on because we're almost at that point, but I don't want to ruin that deal for them. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but for like past and like current projects, here's like the, the ones I find most interesting. The conversion, like we'll take an apartment building and then we'll split off some units to make more units. And I, I posted this earlier today too. Like uh, a couple of months ago, Taco and I had like a 12 unit apartment building in Welland and we split off some of the units and now we split, well, sorry, we split off some of the two bedroom units for a one bedroom and bachelor. So now we got from 12 to 17 units without, Ooh. you know, making the building bigger. You know, we've actually taken the same space and just split it off in half basically, right? Wow. So we increase the unit count there, right? And especially in Welland, they were, Sorry, excuse me. They they were more than happy to kind of like do that pretty fairly quickly. Actually, it's like it's incredible. And now, like, uh, we're doing another project in Guelph. And again, I posted that earlier today that we're we're taking like a four story, three uh four story three bedroom apartment building, fifteen units, and we're we're doubling that to thirty units. The whole goal is fifteen to thirty in the same building show. We're not making it bigger or smaller. It's just the same thing, just splitting off the units. And to me, I'm like, this is incredible because. A lot of these older buildings are so massive. Like their their bedrooms are just massive enough that you can do all this work without, you know, obviously making an addition. Right. Hmm. So that's that's hmm. what really gets me a unique <laughs> style there. So I have a question then. So do you guys have a minimum size that the units must be? Where it's like, you know, this is too big, so I can split it. Like most I, I believe that that's also part of the code, right? Like must mm-hmm. the units be a minimum size where you feel like if I can get two of this size within this, then I can actually split it into mm-hmm. the two. Like there, like there's no, uh, there's no minimum unit size per building code. Some cities like Hamilton have a minimum unit size dependent on the zoning, like 700 square feet in some areas. But like, let's say building code, for example, this Guelph building, I think uh, the three bedroom units were about a thousand square feet, right? About a thousand or 1100 square feet. I can't recall off the top of my head, but around that mark, and so the idea is the one bedroom unit would be 500 roughly, and the bachelor would be about 400 square feet. Again, we have to accommodate for like the common hallway and all the, the fire separation between them, right? So we're looking at about that much. Uh, we, we're trying to get fit in two bedrooms in that space, but again, because of building code room sizes, there is a minimum room size to every you know bedroom, kitchen, living, dining, right? So we have to be able to meet those requirements. But mm. if we can do that, then yeah, I, I, I want to, I'm trying to push for two bedrooms plus bachelor. Mm, so nice. that's how we kind of look at that. There's no minimum units count there either. It's like we can take eight to 12 or six to seven. It, it doesn't matter there. It just doesn't, the, the numbers work because example, like if we were just taking this from like 15 to 20 or 15 to like six, 16 or 17, all that work we're going to be preparing for this it doesn't make sense to do it for one or two units yeah, versus yeah. if we can do it for all of them. And I sure. say that because some investor that came to me saying, I want to do this project Henry right now from 16 to 17 and do the other three units in the future, like a year from now. Yeah. It really doesn't really make my, sense. Yeah. doesn't make sense. I'm like, why, why not do them all now? And again, the building permit does have an expiration date, but you can renew it and extend it. So it's not like you're in a rush to do so at that point, but you might as well do everything now. So in the future, a year from now, you, if you want to sell it, you can sell it with the approved plans or you can start construction. It's just up to you at that point. Okay. Okay. So, you know, like we've spoken for, I would say 40 minutes now on what I call the black box. You know, it's like <laughs> a lot of these things, you know, it's, you've, you've mentioned taco multiple times on the, on this call. He knows it. And I imagine like people reaching out to you guys, sending out DMs, like to learn more about these things. But outside of that, I know you guys have taken a proactive approach to create a community you know, to help people learn more about these things, right? So, you know, I mm-hmm. thought you could maybe walk us through, you know, what that community is, what that community is about, you know, how that started and, you know, how that's going. 
Right, right. No, it, it, we're very excited for this community because I think it all started from the last multifamily conference, right? Uh, Taco introduced this whole Discord stuff to the rest of us. And, you know, I, I think it clicked one day that we kind of want to make this like a, a very open community and make sure it's everyone, not just one person. Yeah. Right. So, you know, a couple of us got together. We're just like finalizing on a couple of things and just say, listen, let's just, you know, make sure everyone's included, make sure everyone has a say in it. Everyone's able to, you know, speak their own mind. Yeah. Right. And be sure we're able to share as much information as we can without paying for it. Because the whole purpose of the community is just to share, like similar to what I do myself. Yeah. And I'm sure you can vouch for me there. I go to every single event. <laughs> at every Bro. Yeah. You know, you're like the party man of you're the real estate party guy, you know, like every event you're there. And I love it. Honestly, I love, love, love it. It's good. I just love connecting with people and, you know, chatting with them, seeing what they're doing, what I'm doing, and see if we can help each other out. Again, I'm not do going there for business. I'm just going there to have a good time and understand how everyone's going at the, the real estate because it's such a massive, you know, uh, business that there's so many different categories to it. I love just to learn about it. But okay. uh, back back to the whole growth thing. Yeah, so it started like after a multifamily conference, we started doing a couple of things. I think our first event in person was at the Tacos where, uh, Workshop back okay. in November, early November, give or take. And from there, we saw so many people kind of understand the process. Again, trying to help them understand that, yeah. you know, the permit process, the paperwork there, and even the construction side there, right? It's a, it's a operation. It's not really just like you can take your stuff and leave one day. Yeah. Like, you can't just close shop one day and just say, hey, guys, we're not doing this anymore. Like, no, it's, a, it's an operation that Taco runs there that's, you know, it's going to be staying there for a while, right? And for them yeah. to see it in person, right, it's a tremendous value to them, right? Everything's mm -hmm. a one-stop shop. But back to the, you know, the whole growth thing uh, at that point. Afterwards, now we're starting to see, after that whole event, we're like, do we want to do this on a quarterly basis? Do we want to kind of invite other people to, to be part of it? No, the idea was to share the information to everyone. So we're collaborating with a lot of other investor groups, right? We collaborate with like, you know, the, the Winx uh, group. We collaborate with the, uh, what's it called? The Infinite thing. Uh, and then, yeah, it's pretty much the whole. <laughs> 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 we're, we're, we're collaborating with as many people as we can, right? So we're, we're trying to see, we can share our information as much as possible. And today, now, uh, you know, we're collaborating again with another investor group for April. Uh, information to be determined in the next couple of days. But yeah, it's just sharing the information there. And again, at the end of the day, it's all free just because we like to give information out. And even on top of that, I think every we're on live four times a week. So similar to your, yeah. you know, your wholesale Wednesday, our team is on live like four times a week from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, yeah. just giving out information there, having a, a long, deep conversation with some investors, explaining to them different sides of the business from deals to construction to the permits of I deal with, right? So, you know, you can pick and choose which one you want to come, right? Yeah. But it's all there for free and helping them understand the whole process. Honestly, man, like, um, you know, you mentioned wholesale Wednesdays and I do that once a week. I can't even believe, I can't, I, I can't even begin to imagine the level of dedication that you guys have to do this four times a week. Even with once a week, it, bro, it's like, that's dedication. Well, four times a week, you know, one of the things that just like intrigued me with like the Grow Group is the fact that like you all have, and, and Taco mentioned, you guys have individual, you know, skill sets where the, the collaborative nature of everyone in the group, um, you know, it's powerful, right? Like you have someone who does designs and permits, you have a realtor, or you have two realtors, you have you know, Taco who is in construction. So you, you sort of have like the full breadth and um, of, of, of skill sets there. So um yeah, yeah kudos to you guys man like doing that four times a week um like I, I i've been part of that community you know you guys worked with us for our one year celebration so like that was fantastic as well um yeah man so what's the plan with grow you know for the next couple of months in, in, like in 2024 you know, like what i guess you can do yeah so our main plan right now is just trying to expand, grow as much as we can, right? We've obviously targeted like the GTA, the Hamilton, the Niagara regions, right? But now we're we're spreading out a little bit further to like the, the KWC area. We want to spread out to like the London, Windsor area. We want to spread out a little bit up north to the Collinwood area, right? And collaborate collaborate with a lot of other investor groups up there, right? I, I've been to their events. I love their events, right? But we can collaborate and bring our network of like, we're almost at 400 people now, Ooh. right? 
So we're, we're very excited to that. You know, I know Taco's <laughs> been talking about the countdown. I think today he was like, there's 10 more people left, and then we're at the 400 mark, and we were just getting excited. We're like, this is amazing after a couple months. So we're just like, yeah, so we'll collaborate with other networking groups and try to expand, you know, the knowledge that we have with everyone else, right? It's like, why, are we, why are we paying for knowledge when we can just share it for free, right? That's, we're not trying to make money off this, right? Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. Like, you know, I think a lot of people don't give free stuff credits. Like, when you hear it's free, like, oh, no, it's free. Like, nah, it's not valuable. <laughs> you know, but I think, like, the host of Wednesdays is also free as well. And, you know, some people yeah. feel like, ah, it's free. You know, but, you know, kudos to you guys for, you know, sharing that content for free and not charging. Um, maybe when you start charging, people will be like, ah, wow, this is fantastic. I need to join. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day, one day. But for now, like, we're, we're trying to help out the, the investors who need the help, right? A lot yeah. of them are struggling or have been screwed by other people, by their, you know, by their agents or other contractors or other designers, like, you know, people people have horror stories, right? Yep, so yep. we're trying to make sure that, you know, it doesn't happen again. You know, we're open to work with people from across Ontario to make sure that they don't fall victim again. Yep. Right. Yep. And just making sure it's a helping hand because who else is going to reach out like that? Right. Let's go. Not very many. Okay, man. So um, you might have heard whenever we come on the on, on, on the episode I'm interviewing anybody, we usually ask, you know, a question. Is it, like we call it the question of the show. and that question is, can you tell us your greatest L in real estate? And L could be learning, it could be like loss, any, any event that maybe didn't go too well. Like everyone shares wins. We've shared wins for the past for something minutes. Now we want to share like the not so good stuff, but the stuff Perfect. where you learned the most, you, you, you grew the most. You know, can you walk us through mm -hmm. that event? No, uh, no, I'm happy to share it because for me, it's no shame or whatever. It's just making sure nobody else you know, follows the same pathway and making sure that they, they understand from my mistakes there. Like I would say my biggest mistake in the real estate world right now is trying to do my triplex on my own. And mm. what I mean by that is at that time, and again, people can say, you know, Taco could have helped you, but Taco was a little bit busy at that point. Right. Yeah, and of course yeah. me being me, I just want to see if I can do it myself and test my limits as an, an investor. And this is like <laughs> two years ago. Right. So you know, I, I had an option to do a duplex, but I'm like, ah, oh, everyone does a duplex. Let's, <laughs> let's do a triplex. You know, how hard could that be? And again, two years ago. So <laughs> I, I, I did that, but I, obviously I didn't account for a lot of the costs that associated with a triplex, fire separations, all gutted, brand new bathrooms, updated water lines, like all these little things that add up. It's like, I didn't really account for obviously and the time. holding costs. Yeah. And yeah. And time, because like, you know, and of course the contractors at that point were, you know, uh, I'll come back next week or I'll do this next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Or I'll do... And I'm like, well, fuck, if I was working with somebody who's really good, then, you know, it, 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 we would have been able to get this in and out in a few months versus like nine, 10 months that we were in there. Right. Oof. So it, it just depends. Like my biggest mistake there was kind of to do it on my own. Obviously I, when I have like those rare questions, talk would, would be able to support me, but you know, most of it, you are doing it by yourself and trying to make sure you can work with the, the team that you have there. And again, because it's like an hour and a half away from me, it's even more difficult than running my own business and doing that at the same time. It was just a, a tremendous headache there, right? So my, my advice is there, like, you don't have to do it alone. You, you know, make sure you work with a real estate investor focused people, team. Mm -hmm. And that's how we kind of like learn and grow from there, right? It's like, you know, it's painful, but at the same time, like if you need to be, if you need to reach out, it's definitely worth going into reaching out to people. Boom. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you for the time. Thank you for like the 50 minutes of just bomb drop in. Um, you know, thank you for joining us today. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, reach out to grow, like, you know, how do they do that? Yeah, the best way to reach me, honestly, is just by Instagram. So it's at R O J A S Empire. So Rojas, Rojas Empire. Empire. Rojas there Empire. you go. There you okay, go. So go. I'm always on. I'm honestly always on that. And, you know, it's no trouble for me to, you know, have a quick call with you. Right. It's like, you know, I, I want to be driving most of the day anyways. I might <laughs> as well talk to people too sometimes. Cool, man. Love it. Thank you very, very much, Henry. And, uh, you know, this brings us to the end of the show. Thank you very much, guys, for listening to the Deals and State Wholesaling podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple, on Google, on Spotify. And please ensure you hit that subscribe and notification button so that you know when Henry's episode drops and you know when the other episodes drop. So until then, 
Remember, a day keeps scarcity at bay.